Good afternoon. I uh, have the honor of being the last speaker. Wonderful honor, and I appreciate you all letting the carpetbagger come down here and talk to you all. We're going to have to shift, you're going to have to shift gears, okay? I have no pictures, all words, okay? So you got to shift gears. I'm coming at it from a different point of view, coming at it from a contractor trying to hustle living shorelines to property owners. And it's a different ball game than working with an NGO and willing property owners. If you're actually out in the market trying to sell these things, it's a, it's a little bit different story. <clears throat> Introduce myself a little bit. I've been around for a while. I've started, I worked a couple of years at the Corps of Engineers. I worked 27 years at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science in the wetlands program where I did wetlands inventories, uh, NPDES discharges, dredging impacts, uh, wetlands monitoring, and permit reviews for the Marine Resources Commission and the Corps. And I did literally thousands of them. I then went and spent nine years at the NOAA Restoration Center in Virginia, where we had a, I was the technical manager for the community-based restoration program. I was a technical manager on five to 10 projects every year uh, for those nine years. And they ranged anywhere from dam removals to SAV plantings, but the major portion of them were wetlands restorations, oyster restorations, and um, <clears throat> living shorelines. In 2006, I started this, my little company called Wetland Design and Restoration. I had a contract to do the, mon the five-year monitoring for a wetland bank, and that's what kind of got me started. But I've kept on doing it since I retired. Oh, another thing, I've, in Virginia, the permits are issued, the wetlands permits are issued by local wetlands boards. And I've been on the, the Gloucester County Wetlands Board where I live for th almost 30 years. It's just not my experience when Tracy, where'd she go? Yeah, she's back there. She called me the wild card. So you get to play me with any of the other presentations today. But it wasn't just me. I've called uh, three other contractors, people that I've worked with over the years, and asked them a set of questions. How are they doing? What are their maintenance? Do you make money on them? You know, what's the demand for them? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and uh, present that to you. It's, it's a, a simulation of my experience plus the experience of several other people that have worked in the field. These are some of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, when I was in school in ROTC class, a sergeant would say, you want to teach somebody something, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And whenever he, uh, something was on the uh, test, he'd take his ruler and slap the side of the desk. This is going to be on the test. So I'm going to tell you, this is what I'm going to tell you. Regulatory from financial effectiveness, all those things in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> Before I get started, I'll do a little, do a little, be a little philosophical with you. When you're designing a project or when you're working on a project, you have to go through a process. Um, this is part of it, and this is a corollary to the marketing axiom that you can acquire goods and services in three ways. You get them fast, cheap, or good, but you only get two. So if it's fast and good, it ain't cheap. If it's cheap and good, it ain't fast. So this is what you, but when you do a, pro, when you do a project, it's really easy to get two of those three. The trick is getting all three, making it effective, acceptable, and affordable. A lot of times something can be Effective and affordable, but nobody likes it. It's not acceptable. Sometimes if it's acceptable to everybody and you can afford it, it ain't worth doing. 
The trick is getting all three. And a lot of people and contractors and engineers, they go through this process, but they don't realize they're doing it. But when you do a project, whether it's a scientific project or a construction project, any kind, this, you have to go through this process in order to get a good project. <clears throat> All right, so much for the philosophy. In Virginia, they have a joint permit application. You fill it out, it goes to everybody, it goes to the Corps, it goes to the state, it goes to the local wetlands boards, it goes to the Department of Environmental Quality, it goes to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the, in the state. Same application. For a living shoreline, the Corps, they have regional permit, they have a nationwide permit, and they also have a general permit. In Virginia, the Corps does not like to issue, issue individual permits. The Corps staff will do everything under their power to make your permit application fit under one of those three categories. Makes their life simple, makes your life simple. If you know some of the basic tenets about it, it's not hard to get into one of those three categories. The state uh, regulators, they regulate the state-owned bottom below mean low water. And if your sill or whatever you're building goes below mean low water, you have to get a permit from them. <clears throat> and they oversee the local wetlands boards. And they are in the process of initiating a state general permit, which will facilitate the process of getting a living shoreline permit from the state and the local wetlands boards. <clears throat> Each locality in the state of Virginia, every county, city, town, has its own local wetlands board. Seven people appointed by the county supervisors. They receive the applications, they go out and look at the project, they evaluate it, they have a staff presentation, and they make the decision on whether to issue the permit from a local level. So, because the wetlands are above the, the state's jurisdiction, they are the sole, really the sole determinants of the wetlands issue from the state's perspective. <clears throat> and because there's 30 some, or 30 or 40 different localities, you have lots of different perspectives and prerogatives, and you have to know how to play those in each individual locality as a contractor. But in general, living shorelines are accepted, they're preferred, and it really, by and large, really is not hard to get a permit to do a living shoreline in Virginia. However, when you go through the regulatory process, there's some Sometimes it gets a little sticky. When you go through, sometimes you can get, a regulator wants to change, change your design a little bit or moving around for some particular issue, like one, of these, <clears throat> like one of these design constraints. If you're encroaching too much below mean low water, you've got SAV offshore, or you've got adjacent shellfish resources, they'll want to, Scrunch your design up, steepen your slopes, raise your, lower your revetment, raise your, your sill, all these kinds of things that can really play havoc with your design. And in, in the long run, this des design scrutiny can increase the scope and complexity of your project. And they don't think your sill is high enough, so they want it to be higher. Well, a lot of times they don't realize that makes it bigger at the base. So you have to plan accordingly. But sometimes they're getting better, but the regulators a lot of times get a little confused. Okay, any questions? Yeah, any questions? You know, if, if you have a question while I'm talking, please raise your hand. 
Because we can, I, I don't mind getting things while it's hot on your mind. All right. <clears throat> One of the questions I ask my contractor friends and from my own experience is, all right, what are the financial considerations? Can you make, you make money? Uh, <clears throat> is it a burden? You lose money, whatever. <clears throat> First of all, core logs, shell bag, and fill plantings uh, are, on the whole, much less expensive than rock structures. Anytime you start putting rock in there, it jacks the project, cost of the project up exponentially. Um, it's basically, you're looking at an alternative between, some, between a revetment and a marsh sill in the planting. Well, the marsh sill, in many cases, the volume of rock in your sill is not that much different from the volume of rock that you'd have to put in as a revetment. So what have you got? You've got the cost differential is the sand and the plants, which in some processes can be significant. They're more complicated to build than riprap and bulkheads. They're more complex, uh, there are more risks, more unknowns. <clears throat> they oftentimes can take longer than you expect them to do, expect them to, and it's a difficult working environment. Whenever you, <clears throat> you'll see someone there, you have to expect that your machines will get wet. You know, a lot of times you don't have the luxury of having some nice sand pedestal out there. You have to actually drive the machine out in the water. I've got some great pictures of that. You can't even see the tracks, just the, the cabs swinging around back and forth in the water. In most cases, it's always easier and cheaper to build a bulkhead, a riprap. I don't like to say that, but like I said, you've got to shift gears and come at it from a different point of view. In reality, that's the fact. And one of, one of my contractors was very emphatic about this. For you engineers out here, and you contract um, people that are letting out RFPs. This is a critical, critical point of view from, doing a, from letting, a, letting a contract to build a living shoreline. You should always pre-qualify your bidders. You ask for a, you know, submit a statement of qualifications where you show their experience doing it, how many they've done, references, all that kind of stuff. I've gone through the tortures of the damned, going through the low bidder contest. I had one, the guy came in half what the, the second bid was. It took me three weeks to get the guy to admit that he couldn't build it for that. Through the whole time, the project time table, all the, you know. But this is something that can be done in the procurement process that is really, really important is to pre-qualify the bidders. It's not hard to do, it's an accepted practice, and it gets you out of having to accept the low bidder with no qualifications. Because that does happen. You'll get contractors that'll lowball you and you're stuck with them. Not, not good. <clears throat> All right, one of the questions I asked was how effective are these? Our living shorelines. They're very effective if they're designed correctly. They can be uh, <clears throat> comparable to traditional structures. <clears throat> they're a more natural approach. You've seen all this, less advert, um, all these things. But one of the things that's, that's critical in this is this word effectiveness. When you go to meet a property owner and he wants to talk about doing a project, he has some concerns. And one of those concerns is, is he doesn't want his upland property to erode anymore. Period. That's you, you, the living shoreline and the marsh and all that stuff is, is really great, 
and wonderful, but in the, in the end, the property owner is going to want you to somehow or another, you know, guarantee that his property is not going to erode anymore. So, you have to be ready to deal with that and address it. Consumer demand, this is one of the things, well, Tracy gave me all these stupid questions to ask, so you can blame it all on her. One of the questions was, what about consumer demand? Well, in reality, it's kind of, a, I got kind of mixed, mixed results. One guy said, since the recession was over, he's seen more of an increase in, in demand for living shorelines. But oftentimes, when the contractor goes to a site, he will see that this is a good site to do a living shoreline. It's got all the right pieces. Low bank, shallow offshore, nice sandy substrate, not a whole lot of fetch, all the things that go into the puzzle. But you, you have to tell the guy it's going to cost more than building a riprap, building a revetment. And, but you have to kind of sell them on this is the doing the right thing. And you're actually going to have a better project when you get finished. And this is one of the things that uh, several of, several of the, my colleagues said, the NGO advocacy is a major factor in the demand for living shorelines. The more it's advocated and promoted by the NGOs, the more demand it creates. They said it's a really, really important part of the process. And like all new concepts, they have, sometimes they can be slow to be accepted because it's new. And, hell, the average person, you go, what's a, you know, go build you a living shoreline. Well, what in the dickens is a living shoreline? You, and then you try to explain it to them. And they thought that you've even further lost your mind. But what's, um, let me get on to, this gets into the red, the, uh, another th point that came up was the education process. Educating the regulators, of all people, so that they're familiar, they're familiar with the design concepts. They know that it has to be so far offshore and you can't, and you need 10 to 1, and you can't scrunch it up shore, scrunch it inshore and steepen it up to three, 3 to 1 and make it work. You can't do that. And you, you need to have a certain height of sill, it has to be so far offshore, and Educating them, like I think a lot of you here are regulators. I'm not thinking, saying that you don't know this stuff. But there are times when that process can complicate things a little bit. And another thing is, that, you know, a lot of times uh, it doesn't fit. Living shorelines don't fit neatly into the institutional framework. They're not, you know, they don't fit because they're a combination of everything. And they, they, you, it's hard to categorize them one way or another. So as part of this education process, we need more successful examples. So you, if you're talking to John Smith, he can say, go down the road and look at Joe Smith's property or go look at the park property or something. And this is what we're talking about. Public seminars and workshops like this are a critical component of getting that education process. Something that is coming, but actually getting, and it's hard to do. It's hard to pull the contractor to take a day off from work to come listen to you babble. All right? But it's really, really important. Am I doing anything wrong? No. Okay. I thought you were getting ready with that cane, you're going to pull me off. <laughs> but there is, a, if you go to the, the VIMS website, they have a contractor training manual on the VIMS website that you can get. 
that has a lot of the design criteria because living shorelines aren't a panacea. They don't work in all cases. You have to be able to fit them where they fit uh, and sometimes, in some cases, the site just isn't amenable to a living shoreline, period. The best thing you can do is build a revetment and walk away. Because if your water's too deep offshore, the bank's too high, you can't grade it back, you're working in mud, there are lots of places where living shorelines simply will not work. And you've got to have the education and the knowledge and the training to know, know when to hold them and know when to fold them. I just thought of that. Again, the NGO advocacy is really, really critical. Because without that advocacy, without the promotions that they do, without the, um, the press they get in the newspaper, all these things are critical to advancing this concept, making people aware of it, and getting them to think about it when, when the time comes for their property. Okay, this is, all right, are the customers satisfied with their living shoreline? By and large, they are if it's designed and constructed properly. And that's a sort of a caveat with whether it's a bulkhead or riprap revetment, anything. But you must meet the homeowner's desires. And one of his desires is going to be, in all likelihood, I don't want any more of my yard to go overboard. And it's something that you have to be prepared to address in your design. And given the right circumstances, you can design it so that his yard stays right where it is. One thing came up is a, a lot of shoreline property owners can be real particular about how their property looks. Like this nice straight grasses. I wonder who calibrates the lawnmowers. You know, everybody's grass is exactly the same height. How do they calibrate the, everybody's lawnmower to make them all the same height? But you, you're not going to have that manicured look with a living shoreline. It is going to be natural and it is going to be, it's going to have some rough edges. So that's one of the things that you, you have to deal with when you're, you know, working on, you know, working with your client to come up with a project. Debris accumulation issues. In Virginia and the York River where I live, there's lots and lots of eelgrass. And when the eelgrass de leaves dehiss in the middle of the summer and they start washing up in windrows on the beach, it can get funky. And a lot of the breakwaters and living shoreline seals, they are a magnet for that stuff. And it, you know, one of my neighbors, his, his neighbor, he, uh, he came to get some plants from me the other day, my neighbor's fussing because the eelgrass is washing up behind my breakwater and it stinks. Well, deal with it. Nothing, <laughs> nothing you can do with it. This is one of mine. And I think it's an underutilized component of the design and the marketing of living shorelines. If, if you build a riprap revetment, or you build a bulkhead, by and by, you will lose whatever intertidal beach is in front of it, and you will not be able to get to the water without some other kind of structure. You will not be able to walk into the water, period. Ipso facto. Never happened. By designing the gaps that nobody likes to put in these things, judiciously placing them, designing a little beach in there, you can give this person access, unfettered access to the work. Built one in, up in Gloucester County and I went down to look at it and check it out after it was, 
And it was the coolest thing in the world. These three little girls in their bikinis could walk and down. They walked right out into the river and swam around like they had good sense. Okay? But if we had built a riprap revetment there, they never would have been able to do that. Never would have been able to do that. But from your, from your all professional standpoint and marketing, this is an underutilized aspect of living shorelines. Because you can design, that's what I tell people, you want to get to the water? Man, that's no problem. We can build, build you a little beach. Everybody likes beaches. Not a problem. Okay? You design it. You put a little blivets out for the, on the edge of the sill. Move the diffraction point offshore. You have a nice little beach in there. You can launch your kayaks, launch your canoes, go swimming. We'll do whatever you want to do. It's something that's it's, it's there, but a lot of people don't um, utilize it. Maintenance, rack and debris cleanup, of course. And the contractor said that you need to be able to, you have to expect to be able to go and put some more sand in there. The sand settles, the sand washes around, you got little berms form, you lose some of the elevation, the elevation that you planned on for the marsh. So you have to be, you're figuring the cost and everything, that's something that you need to take into consideration that you may have to go back in there once you've finished and put some more sand in there. They're <clears throat> replanting. Depends upon how good a planter you are, what the materials were when you planted it. Uh, may not be an issue, but also at the same time, if you're, I'm going to build this thing and I'm going to warranty this thing for a year. You're expecting, you have to factor into your cost of going back the next spring and filling in the void. Goose fencing. I don't know what it's like in here, around in North Carolina, but those guys can eat you out of house and home in a heartbeat. I had a project in the southern branch of the Elizabeth River, 1.3 acres of marsh, the geese ate or pulled up $10,000 worth of plants in two weeks. Gone. Gone. It's really, really important if they're an issue as far as maintaining your site, you have to put up goose fencing. You have to honor the threat. What is that? What is goose fencing? Uh, goose fencing is you put a... It's... It's stuff a lot like this. This plastic mesh, except it comes in rolls. You drive one, you know, I use one by one tomato steaks every, about every 20 feet. You wrap it around, you put it, you have to put it all the way around. Because the geese won't always swim in from the river. They'll land back in the yard and walk in from the land side. And if it's big, once you do it, you have to take some twine and put a spider web of twine over the top of it because the suckers will fly in. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to know about, but it's really, really, um, really, really important. You need to get straight on who's going to do the monitoring and the maintenance, the long-term maintenance responsibility. One wetlands board in Virginia requires that if you do a living shoreline, you've got to monitor it for three years. But that's one of the vagaries of having a whole bunch of different um, localities governing this thing. Everyone has their, their little quirk and their little prerogative. One of them is you have to monitor it for three years. And if it's a, if it's a public private or it's a public um, project, and you're the contractor or the engineer, you got to get straight on who's responsible for the maintenance, who's going to do what and to whom and with which over the long term. It's really important so that you don't get yourself in a bind later on. 
All right, this is when I put in some practical considerations. This is from my experience, and a lot of them. A lot of times they try to build these things with machines that are too big to do it. But that's got to be caveated with how far you have to reach. And the Bobcats are the greatest things in sliced bread for doing this kind of work. They can scoot out and spread out the sand, don't have a lot of ground pressure, they can move. Greatest thing in the world. The near shore work will be wet and sandy. By and large, your, your machine will get wet during the construction. And it's not just the water, it's the sand. We'll put a lot of wear and tear on the undercar undercarriage of your machine. So you've just got to factor it in. Soft substrates. Every contractor I've talked to has a horror story of having to have one of his machines winched out of the mud. Every single one of them. You think you got it figured out, next thing you know, it's up to the cab and it's not water. <laughs> the thing that came up every time was you learn something new from every project. It's really, really important to keep your thinking cap on and figure out how you, things are going. And if you didn't learn something, on a project, you probably missed something. But it's really, really important to take that collective experience because that's what, when you go to bid a job, risk and inexperience equals money. And money decreases your, your, your competitiveness. You have to be, the more experience you have and the more you've learned how to do this, the more competitive you can be, the more money you can make, and the better job you will do. But you've got to remember, well, I screwed up on Joe's job, and I'm not going to do that again. You've got to keep those things in your, in your head. There are different requirements for ENS controls. Every locality in Virginia has, they have an overarching set, but they're applied in different ways in different localities. You've got to be straight on where the silt fence has to go, how long it has to stay up. And if you're putting sand overboard, you need to find out whether they're going to require a turbidity boom around the project. Some do, some don't. This is a kicker. And this will burn you every time, if you're not careful. You got this shoreline and all the water's running down the shoreline. And you put this structure in front of it. Where's that water going to go? It's going somewhere. And it will go in the place that you expect it least. So whenever you build, in particularly a, any kind of fill, when you put it offshore and you've got, you're changing the runoff pattern of the shoreline, you've got to be, always be cognizant of where's the runoff going to be? You know, how have I changed the runoff? And it's really, it, it's, it's almost imperceptible. But you'll build this wonderful thing. Man, I bet the greatest projects in, you know, since Methuselah was a baby. You go out after the first rainstorm and half of it is washed down into the river because you didn't take into consideration where the, the storm water was going to go. It's going to go someplace and it's going to go across your project. You need to be thinking about it and be ready to address it. The last thing, and I'll quit talking, I'm running out of gas. Construction scheduling. It's really, really important because of getting your construction scheduled around when you want to plant. Okay, so if you want to plant tomorrow, you need to start a building in December. Okay, you need to factor in whatever 
you think it's going to take so that to the extent possible you can be finishing up in the, in the late spring because that's the optimum planting time. If you get delayed and you build this project in the summertime and then you got to plant in the fall, it can be really bad karma. Sometimes you're better off waiting to do the planting to the next year. Planting um, in the summer is not so bad with the alternate floor, but it can play hell with patents and all the high marsh plants. Keeping them alive in the summertime with no rain can be a disaster. If you get after the summertime, you get back in the other time is September. Now things have cooled off, you get a little more rain, not so much stress on the plants. But Bubba, there's going to be a northeaster that's going to come in and tear everything apart. Or if you do it, and you got it, and you haven't got it in the ground good, and the winter time comes along, and everything freezes, water gets up in there, freezes, grabs a hold of all the plants, tide comes in, whew, all gone. Now, it's really important when you're doing, when you're thinking about this project in the long term, think, uh, you know, start the first of May and work back so that you've got everything done and you're ready to go when the planting season gets here. All right, I did have one more slide. Sea level rise, it's really important in Virginia, it's even worse in Virginia. The relative sea level rise in Virginia is one of the highest in the country and it's a real issue but there are real world barriers, this is one of my quotes from one of my contracts, there are real world barriers to marsh retreat. Sometimes it, you, know, you can design it in there, it's fine, but if, if there's infrastructure in the way or you have an, a, a really high topography, it's really hard to factor it in into a living shoreline. They can allow for marsh retreat if you've got the land side and the slopes land side to accommodate it. And this is, they will eventually be flooded, but so will other structures. I don't know why I put that in there. But anyway, it's true. You know, you sea level rise, it's true. <laughs> but they're better in the short term. I've had philosophical discussions with people that say, well, with sea level rise, why do you bother to do anything? Because it's going to be drowned out. You think about it. Why bother? Well, if you have that attitude, you might as well hang it up on a mahogany peg and watch television. <laughs> but it's, you think whether, if you're thinking about this, is the system better off with it or without it? Even in the short term. Are those benefits going to accrue? And in, almost invariably it'll be yes and it's worth doing. And even though a hundred years from now it's going to be underwater, they got a great, great play while it was in, in, in shape. Okay, I told you what I was going to tell you and I told you and this is what I told you. It is a viable option. It does work. It's not a panacea, but it can be a very effective tool in your toolbox. It can be more expensive if they've got rock involved, but one of my contractors friends said, but really where you make your money is in the markup on the materials. Okay, so that's kind of a double-edged sword. The machine time and that kind of stuff it's all pretty much set, but where you can really, where you make your, what he said, where I make my money is on the markup on the materials. They're more difficult to construct, they're complicated, they can be very effective if designed correctly, and above all, they're the right thing to do. And with that, I'm done. Any questions?
Yes, sir. I can't hear, so I'm going to have to walk down to hear your question. Uh, my question is, as you were talking about handling stormwater runoff, it looks like to me that you have to pretty much design your ES and E plans simultaneously with your you do grading plans. But it will not go where you think it's going to go. <laughs> it never does. It will does. go someplace else. I guarantee it. Unless you're a lot smarter than the average bear, you will go out, you'll have this thing, and it's great. God, it's beautiful. You get a two inch gully washer, and you'll go back the next day, and uh, you know, it's a mel of a hess. But you have to figure out, you know, it, you, have to, you can't figure it out ahead of time. You think you've got it figured out. But regardless, if you think you have it figured out, you've got to be prepared to go down after that first rainstorm and find out that you didn't have it figured out. And be ready to do whatever you need to regrade the upland to put in some sort of a, uh, a level spreader or you know, some core logs or something in there to dissipate the wave energy. Or sometimes it's so bad, what you have to do is you have to put in, you have to riprap a channel across your project to accommodate the storm water. Put in a diversion ditch and lay matting in it? Pardon me? Put in a diversion ditch and play, lay matting in it? Yeah, you can do, you can do whatever. But uh, what I'm saying is, is that when you do it, after the first, rain, first rainstorm, you're going to have to do it again. Guaranteed. Oh, come on. I wasn't that damn good. Uh, no questions? Huh. Yes, yes, there's one in the back over there. When you were talking about the regulatory issues, you mentioned that some of the... Um, Wait a minute, I can't, I, can't, I, I can't hear you. i got to come back. When you were talking about the regulatory issues, mm -hmm. you mentioned about monitoring. Yes. That's required um, by various agencies. Mm -hmm. What kind of monitoring are they requiring of you? It's usually... The, mo the question is the monitoring that's required. Typically, for these types of things, it's usually photos and just you go in and take pictures and you submit a written statement saying I went out and checked the project and everything seemed to be good and if there's some issue that needs to be addressed you know rack accumulation or there's one spot where the plants didn't grow it's not really it's not like doing scientific monitoring like for a wetlands bank that you've I did that one time and it took five years of you know, 30 or 40 quadrats every year, and a lot of surveying and a lot of, it's not really that. It's more of, uh, I took a picture from this end and I took a picture from that end, and you write a little email, a little statement saying everything's hunky-dory, or property owners got to do some more planning or something. It's not complicated, it's just another hoop that you have to jump through. Huh. Yes, sir. How many permits are actually required from an applicant? Pardon me? How many permits are actually required from the applicant from the state? Of the, I mean, is it an umbrella the permit? permit and, and what's the average processing time from, for an applicant to get his permits for construction? All right. If you locate the sill above mean low water, okay, you only need two permits, one from the core and one from the local wetlands board. If you sell in order to get your slope, because that's what you, you don't want to compromise it. If you have to go out five feet below mean low water, then you have to get an, a VMRC permit, a permit from the state. But typically, it's only two. And the core is almost pro forma. You send them the JPA, and it's about five pages long, joint permit application, set of drawings, you send that to the Marine Resources Commission, they assign a number to it, and then they distribute that JPA to everybody. They're the clearinghouse, they assign the number, that then from there, their staff reviews it and sends it to everybody that they think might have a dog in the fight. And from there, everything is processed concurrently. 
The chorus marches to a different drummer. Sometimes they can be a couple weeks, sometimes it's a month, sometimes you have to call them. And as far as the wetlands board is concerned, right now they have to have a public hearing. And that's one of the things that the general permit that the state is working on is trying to get rid of that requirement for a public hearing because these are so simple. But once you've received, received a, um, a completed permit application, you have to have the public hearing within 60 days. And then you have to, and once you've had that public hearing, you have 30 days to make it, you either make it then, or if you don't make it, if it, you wait 31 days, it's automatically approved. But generally, if you time it right, and you, you I have a wetlands board meeting next, next week. So if you went back a month, if you submitted your, knew the timing, and you submitted your permit application the next, you know, the previous month, you would be on this month's agenda. And if you had all your ducks in a row, you would be approved in 30 days. Public hearing, adjacent property owner notice, the whole nine yards. And once you get that and you don't have, you didn't go below mean low water, you get a letter from the Marine Resources Commission that said no permits necessary. Then you find a, whichever field scientist has been assigned, if you haven't heard from the Corps, you find out which scientist it was assigned to and you give them a call and say, hey look, I'm ready to go to work. And they're usually, pretty, if they haven't already done it, they're usually Johnny on the spot because it's, it's a simple, it's a one page. I mean, it's got a bunch of standard conditions in it, but the actual permit's like one page. It's not, it's not that difficult. And you know, in, in Gloucester, where I'm on the board, we encourage them. And we've come a long way working with the contractors, because you, in your locality, you get to be on a first name basis with the contractors. You see them in the grocery store. You see them at the gas station. And they know what's expected. And they provide you what you want to know. And it's really kind of, it's really simple. It's not complicated at all. But that's, you know, part of the process of building up the rapport and the relationship with your contractors. Yes, sir. Walter, as you know, I was born a Virginian and wherever Yeah, we well, don't hold that against you. Wherever I die, I'll still be a Virginian. Yeah. But uh, it may not be obvious to many people in this room that there's the mean low water, mean high water difference is a difference between states and that Virginia is a mean low water state, which the boundary between state and private property is at mean low water. North Carolina, on the other hand, is a mean high water state. So the boundary between state and private ownership is the mean high water, and that's part of the regulatory difference. Yeah, that's a big, 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 big difference. Because in Virginia, if you're a riparian owner, you run out to mean low water. All the mud flats, all the marsh and everything else, the low marsh, everything, you own it. And it's different than in Maryland and North Carolina or high water states, and you only own out to you only own the high marsh, you don't own the low marsh. So it's a little bit, it's a little, it's, it's, he's right, it's different. But it's not that much different. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Tell me what you got. All right, that's all she wrote, dear John. Thank you all.